here. Um, I will read through and you can sort of tick off the names. How's that? Um, and then we will get started. Uh, Jenny Kwan. Present. Erica Shinoy. Present. Um, the, we don't have Judy. Uh, Colleen Kraft. Present. Mike Lynn. Present. Sharon Wright. Present. And then online, I believe we have David Weber. Sorry, present. Yep. Um, is Elaine Decker on? Present. Oh, thank you, Elaine. Um, super. And then I know that uh, we now have Mohammed Fakhi. Yeah. Present. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and I know that Judy's not with us today and Joanne's not right, uh, with us today. So that is our member roll call. Oh, okay. Hi, Joanne. Thanks for joining by phone. Um, excellent. And then for our ex officios, Dr. Lynn HRQ. Present. Dr. Dinsda. Yes. Uh, Jimmy Riss. See? There she Present. Jimmy. Uh, Scott Steffen. Present. David Henderson. Present. Excellent. And then liaisons, Paul Conway, I see you on the line. Present. Thank you. Uh, Patty Costello, not attending today. Mark Rusi. No. Uh, Elizabeth Wick. Nope. Uh, Chris Lombardozzi. Natasha Mason. Nicole Anselm. Nope. Uh, Chris Bryant. Present. Yay. Karen Decay. Present. There you are. Uh, Sarah Smathers. Present. Sarah. Hello. Emily Emerson. Ashley Fell. Uh, Ronell Myberg. Lillian Abo. Ben Schwartz. Present. Ben, Hannah Hinkle. Eve Cooney. Present. Hey, Eve. Uh, Karen Raven. Present. Natalie Bruce. Lisa McGifford. Present. Good morning. Uh, Riza Mauricio. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Hillary Babcock. Present. Stephanie Taylor. Present. Rob Sire. Present. Thank you. Rob. Uh, and Tiffany Wixton. Present. And so we've got meeting and voting quorum. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. So without further ado, um, um, our first uh, session is an NHSN update. Uh, for those of you who are new to our committee, um, we routinely do this about once a year to give you a sense of where the National Healthcare Safety Network, um, which is our primary ongoing surveillance process for healthcare systems data, um, is um, sort of a bit of backstory. Some of you might recall the NIST program, which was the paper-based faxed-in thing that existed in the 90s. Um, that evolved into the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is web-based, and now it is um, increasingly moving towards automated data capture, leveraging EHRs, and so on. Um, that's the, the big arc of progress. The other thing that you may or may not see today, um, as Beth gives us her presentation, uh, is the sort of trajectory of growth. Uh, back when it was paper-based, we had dozens and up to a couple hundred voluntary participants. Uh, we now work very closely with our CMS colleagues uh, who use our data in addition for our purposes um, for uh, quality measures, and reimbursement processes. And because of that, we are now up to 40,000 participants, roughly, 40,000 facilities, um, with the inclusion over the pandemic of a vast number of nursing homes. Um, so all of that has uh, created tremendous growth. I will let Beth take it over from here, and then maybe I'll say a few more words at the end. Beth? Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. So good morning, everyone. I'm Beth Goldshear a public health advisor in DHQP surveillance branch, which leads and manages NHSN. So today I'm going to present our updates on behalf of our branch chief, Andrea Benin. 
So first, I'll provide a brief overview of NHSN, then we can touch on the end of the COVID-19 public health emergency, and then the majority of the updates today will focus on um, the work we are doing to modernize NHSN and our quality measurement. So we typically start most presentations with this slide as all of our work is rooted in advancing DHQP's mission to protect patients and healthcare personnel to promote safety, quality, and value in healthcare. And we all play a role in advancing DHQP's mission because at some point or another, um, our loved ones or ourselves will be in the hospital. And um, I actually have a family member in the hospital right now who is recovering from surgery. And fortunately, everything's gone really well, but um, it is in these moments that I have a greater sense of appreciation for the work that we do. And um, it's just so important that we keep people safe and healthy when they need healthcare. So since 2005, NHSN has served as a nation's surveillance program for healthcare associated infectious diseases, antibiotic use and resistance, patient safety events, and healthcare preparedness. It's the most comprehensive tracking system for emerging and enduring threats to healthcare. So we collect and analyze healthcare data from across the healthcare continuum and healthcare facilities utilize NHSN to integrate data into our prevention efforts. NHSN is also used to support CMS's pay for performance and value-based purchasing programs. And the figure on this slide shows the components of NHSN. So we have our patient safety, long-term care facility, outpatient dialysis, healthcare personnel safety, biovigilance, outpatient procedure, neonatal, and medication safety. So we've grown significantly, as Mike mentioned, since our inception and most notably um, the last few years during the COVID-19 pandemic. We now have over 38,000 facilities that report to NHSN and over 150,000 active users. As you can imagine, our help desk stays very, very busy. Um, we typically receive around 300 help desk tickets a day, and that's on a slow average day. Um, on busier days, we can get up to 800, close to 1,000. And annually, we close more than 85,000 help desk tickets. So um, that just gives you a sense of how engaged we are with the facilities that report to NHSN. And this slide here shows the different facility types that report to NHSN, all hospitals, nursing homes, dialysis facilities, and ambulatory surgery centers in the country currently report to NHSN. And right now, skilled nursing facilities are the highest number of active facilities with over 16,000. These facilities were all onboarded in 2020 when we expanded to have all CMS certified nursing homes report COVID-19 data. Okay, so now I'll touch briefly on the status of COVID-19 data reporting post-PHE. So post-PHE, we continue to collect COVID-19 data from hospitals and nursing homes, and we are actively engaging facilities to disseminate information on changes to those reporting requirements. So the data elements have been reduced for both hospitals and nursing homes. Hospitals will provide weekly submission of daily values through April 2024, which is a change from the daily submission of daily values and fewer data elements. And the nursing homes will report weekly until December 2024. So these data remain important for national surveillance and monitoring, and they are used to update CDC's COVID data tracker weekly. And we continue to collect data on COVID-19 vaccination of healthcare personnel. The first submission of the quarterly measure of up-to-date vaccination for CMS quality reporting programs um, was due May 15th. And this reporting requirement resulted in over 14,000 NHSN help desk tickets and the highest number ever user logins recorded with over 16,000 users logging in daily um, to NHSN leading up to that May deadline. Um, this also coincided with other CMS reporting deadlines, so May was a very, very busy month for us. Um, overall, you know, monitoring the impact of COVID-19 and the effectiveness of prevention and control strategies continues to be a public health priority during the transition from the emergency phase to routine public health practice for NHSN. 
and CDC. All right, moving on to our data modernization and quality measurement. So as demonstrated during the COVID-19 pandemic, NHSN system is agile and it permits timely modification of data collection to meet emerging public health priorities. So modernizing data collection is a public health priority for CDC and we are investing in uh, making investments to modernize our data systems, including NHSN. And we're committed to continuing and improving work in HAIs and antibiotic use and resistance, as well as developing new resources that promote patient safety. So expanding electronic exchange and the integration of information between public health and healthcare is essential for timely, accurate, and accessible disease surveillance. And one goal we are working toward is developing NHSN digital quality measures. And these are fully automated quality measures that are based on standards, measurement science, and clinical science. Um, they will provide patient level data to drive patient safety and quality improvement with rigorous benchmarking and appropriate risk adjustment. So this is um, our NHSN modernization roadmap pipeline. This really summarizes our high priority projects and work in this space, and we're really excited to share um, the work we're doing to modernize NHSN quality measures and our surveillance activities with you today. Um, we are developing fire-based measures for C. diff, HOB, hypoglycemia, and we will be piloting respiratory pathogen surveillance. We're also implementing a project called NHSN Prepare which will expand NHSN reporting capabilities to include bed capacity and all hazards preparedness. So um, briefly, just the NHSN PREPARE project will be CDC-led as the U.S. Biodefense Strategy named CDC as the leader and convener of these data, but it is truly a cross-agency collaboration um, we are actively working with colleagues across CDC, ASPR, CMS, ONC, and others to develop data de elements and engage our stakeholders. So NHSM Prepare will be a vendor neutral and use standardized national definitions. And um, for the bed capacity work, we've currently funded Oregon, Massachusetts, and Hawaii to establish an automated data feed of hospital bed capacity data to NHSN and expected outcomes of that work include aligned capacity definitions, reduced manual reporting, and improved timely response and resource allocation. The all hazards work is focused on data collection of a standardized set of essential elements of information for emergencies. And we are working closely with work group colleagues to plan listening sessions with internal and external stakeholders to better understand the all hazards needs gaps and landscape. Okay, so now I'm gonna touch on all of our quality measure work. And so um, first starting with our new C. diff measure, HTCDI. So, you know, while there was a 20% reduction in C. diff cases from 2015 to 2018, um, they still caused 76,000 facility inquired affections in 2018. So while we've made progress, we recognize that we still have work to do. And we also recognize that there are challenges with the current CDI measure. And we are working to launch a new measure, which we anticipate will address some of the shortcomings of the current measure, such as unintended consequences. So the goals of the new HTCDI metric include increasing face validity and clinical validity, decreasing the reporting burden, and that most importantly, promoting improvement in patient care and safety through better infection prevention practices, diagnostic stewardship, and antimicrobial stewardship. So this slide here shows you the actual um, measure definition. And so the top line is the event, which will serve as our primary measure. And um, the complementary metrics 
um, will be used to drive. They are basically used as balancing measures and measures of unintended consequence. So um, we call this measure suite our measure family. And really, um, all these measures will have patient level data, which we expect to lead to more robust risk adjustment. And the measure families will also enable us to provide dashboards to support quality improvement efforts. So again, these are all fire-based, fully automated measures. And the primary measure will be used for accountability programs with the complementary metrics um, serving um, quality improvement programs and the quality improvement space and, and dashboards. We can just stay on this for a second so people can review. Um, and you can also take a look at these later because we will distribute the slides after. So um, if you all have questions specific to the measures, feel free you know, to contact us after and we're happy to have those discussions. While we're lingering on the slide, I'll just share that if you as members, ex officios and liaisons have an interest in joining the NHSN working group, that is a great place to have deep dive discussions about these metrics and the processes that go into sort of selecting them and fleshing out the family. We're also working on a hospital onset bacteremia measure, so HOB. And the purpose of this new measure is um, surveillance for broader reduction of bloodstream infections. Um, the definitions are shown here, but we can look at it more closely. We have a, a similar table as the HTCDI that I, that I just showed you that has the, the measure family. Um, that we'll look at that in a second. Let's go to the next slide. And so um, why are we developing the new HOB measure? So. Um, um, with, in partnership with um, our partners, we've done research and in an observational case match study of HOB and CLABZ, it was found that bacteremia is not associated with central line infections, are still associated with longer stays, higher cost, and higher mortality. And so, um, as you can see here, the, the non clabz HOV events are um, highlighted in the red boxes mm -hmm. and um, those are uh, have they, they have a similar impact to cloud bees. And the same study found here that um, there are more than four times as many HOB as cloud bee events. And of the 403 NHSN reported cloud bees, 90 or sorry. 70% um, met the HOB definition and were picked up by our new HOB measure. And again, this is um, the slide that shows you the main HOB event, um, that definition, the numerator and denominator, and then the complementary metrics that will be used for quality improvement, risk adjustment, and developing dashboards. Okay, and then we just wanted to give you a sense of the timeline and where we are in this work. So um, we've already submitted these measures to um, the MUC list and they've also been submitted to the measure endorsement process. And in April of this year, we did our, what we call a soft launch in the NHSN application for our pilot sites to um, begin um, testing for testing of these measures and the use of the measures. So um, the pilot sites are NHSN Colabs and their um, academic and um, healthcare partners that we work with to test and implement these um, new measures. Uh, basically, you know, like the sandbox that we use to understand how these measures will work before, um, you know, we move them forward. So um, really exciting work happening with our NHSN Colabs. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. And, um, you know, we've completed scientific studies, we've had manuscripts accepted, and then others are in preparation for um, our HOB and CDI work. 
and we expect to launch for a full launch in the NHSN application for all acute care hospitals sometime in 2024. Beth, do you want to quickly say what MUC stands for? Um, measures under consideration. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> thank you. It's not about cleaning stables or anything like that. <laughs> okay, so we are also developing a measure for hypoglycemia um, with the goal to automate measurement of inpatient medication-related hypoglycemia data using Firebase standards and to facilitate benchmarking of hypoglycemia rates for U.S. hospitals. So I think we can go to the next slide. So this shows you our, our primary metric and the complementary ones for hypoglycemia. this for a moment. And so we did launch, do the soft launch for hypoglycemia um, for pilot sites in February 2024. Um, we've actually successfully received a fire bundle from one of the collab sites, which is very exciting. And um, similar to our other measures, we're aiming for a 2024 launch in the NHSN application for acute care hospitals. So on to respiratory pathogen surveillance. So our respiratory pathogen surveillance or RPS module, it will measure measure facility and unit-specific incidence and prevalence of COVID-19, influenza, and RSV in patients. So this is another example of ways we are expanding NHSN surveillance to improve our ability to prepare and respond to public health threats. Go to the next slide. Um, and this just gives you a sense of the different data elements for RSV, COVID-19, and influenza. And again, this will be 100% um, uh, fully automated electronic data capture um, for these data elements. And so we're doing our soft launch of the RPS module in August of 2023. And then um, again, we, we would expect this to go live in the NHSN application in 2024 at some point. And um, I did you know, mention the NHSN collab. So we are currently piloting all of these fully automated electronic measures through our NHSN collab sites. And they are an example of NHSN collaborating with our healthcare partners to test, pilot, implement, and validate new measure concepts and approaches to data exchange. So this work is aligned with the CDC's data modernization initiative, and it will inform approaches to healthcare event data collection and surveillance concepts that support patient safety, quality reporting, national benchmarking, and public health preparedness and response. And the slide here um, is a visual representation of the collab sites that we are currently engaged in. Right now, we have um, about eight that we have um, formal agreements in place with. Um, we're also talking to others and um, you can check out the NHSN website. Um, we have a, a page specific to the collab work on our webpage, and um, we'll be updating that as you know this work develops and changes. So you can learn more about the collabs there. All right. 
And then finally, we wanted to be sure to update you all on the work that we are doing to support CMS's promoting interoperability program and on antibiotic use and resistance reporting. So AUR surveillance in NHSN is fully automated and currently thousands of hospitals report AUR data voluntarily. And this is set to change in 2024 when hospitals will be required to report these data under the CMS promoting interoperability program. And so we estimate this year that about 4,500 facilities are eligible for the proponent interoperability program. And currently, as of May 1st, 2023, the cumulative number of facilities that have reported at least one month of AU data was around 28,000 and those reporting AR data was close to 14,000. So um, we have about more than half of those facilities that are eligible already reporting AU data, which is great. Um, AR is a little bit behind, but we've made significant progress there as well in the past couple of years. Um, so that's really good news. And to date, 435 facilities can attest to being in active engagement with NHSN um, using the submission option. So um, that would mean that they would meet those program requirements if um, the rule went into effect tomorrow. So um, obviously we still have some work to do, but it's um, really promising that we already have, you know, facilities that are um, that meet those requirements. So we are making considerable progress and um, we will continue to engage these facilities through training, outreach, and, and resources. Okay, so that wraps up our, our updates for today and we're really excited about all of these efforts and our vision to modernize NHSN and automate data collection and reporting. Um, to improve surveillance and advance patient safety. So thanks for your support and, and being part of moving this vision forward. And um, before we take questions, I want to turn it over to Mike Bell for some comments. Well, Beth, thank you for that. That was a lot. Um, <laughs> I apologize to everyone for the density of our slides, but, but when it comes to surveillance, if you don't include some of the density, it's really not informative. So if you need more time to look at them, you know they're available online, and so you can always uh, take a closer look. And of course, as Beth mentioned, the website, similarly very dense, but full of information. So, so please take a look if you want. Um, I'll, I'll just say I'm also very relieved to know that I'm not the only one that throws extra decimal places out accidentally. It, I think it was 2,800 and 1,400 for AUAR uh, ever participants as opposed to 24,000. Oh, okay. thank you. We would love for it to get there, <laughs> uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, I do that constantly. It's really, it's really bad. Um, so I just want to say a couple of words. Um, you're seeing the active evolution of our measures into more and more electronic um, sort of seamless transfer of data. Um, that has a couple of, of things driving it. One is burden. It takes a lot of time and effort for people to go around with clipboards, collect data, enter it, and do all of that, when really a lot of the people who do that are better positioned to implement prevention practices that we want to see happen. And so we're trying to take that sort of administrative burden away as much as possible. It's been a, a hard slog because technology hasn't necessarily been ready for it up until now, but we're, we're gradually sort of, I think, crossing the Rubicon. So we'll see, we'll see what that looks like in the coming years, but it's very exciting. The other thing that that's doing <clears throat> is taking us away from subjective measures. If you all think back to the uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia measure where people had to look at a chest film together and say, gosh, you think it's an infiltrate or is it fluid overload? And, you know, no one can really agree. And so there is that haziness and the adjudication question comes into play. Um, and none of that's particularly helpful. And what we've shown with ventilator-associated pneumonia is that ventilator-associated event, which makes use of the fact that ventilators are now not just pumps, but they're computers, um, and you can actually track if there's a change in oxygen requirement or the PEEP requirement goes up. And whatever caused it, something happened. That's a ventilator-associated event. It's irrefutable. It happened. It's recorded. And it can be transmitted automatically. If you tie that to things like an elevated white count, the administration of antibiotics, uh, or a positive culture, you can start moving 
towards that ventilator-associated pneumonia um, without any of the subjective pieces um, and with a lot of automation. And then the work that we're doing with HOB versus uh, CLABZ, I think, is the same sort of process where we're moving away from a very burdensome, you know, what was the insertion date, um, you know, all of that for the for the central uh, central line um, uh, insertion. That kind of burdensome piece, if we can switch to something like hospital onset bacteremia, and like we did for ventilator-associated events versus ventilator-associated pneumonia, show that they move in tandem, right? If you do something that reduces ventilator-associated events with the white count and, 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 and the uh, fever and whatnot, that also reduces your ventilator-associated pneumonia rate. And so they move together, and you can use one to replace the other. And we're, so, we're showing the same thing with HOB, um, that if you reduce HOB, you're also reducing CLABZ. In this day and age where CLABZs are fortunately so much less um, common than they were 20 years ago, um, the, the relative benefit of collecting that insertion data um, becomes less and less. And the overall improvement of care by tackling all uh, bacteremias um, is, is more and more appealing. So that's the sort of rationale behind the evolution that you're seeing. It's been a long time coming. Um, I'll say a word about the growth that you saw in the early charts. Um, it has some side effects. It's great, and we are very happy that we've got 38-some thousand, for real thousand, uh, facilities on board now. But that said, they're not all the same. So we learned this the first big level up when we had volunteers from academic centers wanting to send data to do these uh, trend analyses with us. Um, to when suddenly it became required for acute care hospitals, thanks to our CMS colleagues, um, suddenly we had healthcare facilities that were not intentionally wanting to do this. They were being told they had to do that. And the interaction and engagement was different. Um, now when we bring on board groups like ambulatory facilities, um, long-term care facilities, uh, those places are not as ready to do some of this stuff, and yet they're being told they have to. There's the additional piece that not everybody has the same IT infrastructure. It would be great if everyone had you know, the same EHR capabilities, but that's not true, especially in long-term care and in ambulatory settings. And so there's a, a little bit of a gap to close there. The last piece is relevance. Uh, we're doing some side work that we're not talking about today, but trying to figure out what the next generation of metrics look like so that for a small or rural or remote facility that might have one central line per year, what are they doing looking at collapses, right? Why, why would they do that? Um, it makes no sense. And so thinking about what would be useful in those contexts, it's still early days. It's not even on the muck list. Um, it, it, it is the engagement with small and rural communities to figure out what are you seeing, what kind of care are you providing, and what would be valuable to invest the time and effort to measure um, and, and, and evolve in that direction. The um, last thing I'll emphasize is it, it went by kind of quickly, but as Beth mentioned, we're not just looking at healthcare-associated infection outcomes now. Um, again, in part thanks to our CMS partnerships, but also as a way to support the agency writ large, mm -hmm. we're looking at um, additional events. You, you heard about hypoglycemic events um, in inpatient settings. That is a, an interesting collaborative extension of our outpatient um, medication safety work. Um, you might recall that about a decade ago, a little bit more than that, um, you know, we, we did a lot of work on cold and cough medicine overdoses in little kids that take them to the emergency department. Right? That medication safety program then started looking at additional things and is now moving to the inpatient space, making use of NHSN. And that program is starting with hypoglycemia because we've got a very clear automatic laboratory system data stream. Uh, we have pharmacy level data that we can look at. Yeah, to, to, to connect the two, and so it, it becomes a very nice automatable measure um, and certainly something very important for quality since we don't want to see hypoglycemic events uh, in our patients. Um, that approach uh, is being paralleled with venous thromboembolism, again, supporting our, our blood, um, uh, our, what is it, um, blood, no, 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 no. It, it, it's, it's, our, it's our chron... Oh, gosh, they're going to shoot me. Um, anyways, our, our colleagues at CDC who look at blood disorders. Blood disorders. There we go. 
Um, that work is leveraging NHSN's abilities to start looking at VTE as another outcome that can be influenced if you're able to collect data. And then lastly, you heard about the preparedness utilities where, you know, thanks to the COVID experience, there are a lot of people who now expect uh, to be able to see bed availability, staffing limitations, PPE supplies um, in real time. And it's something that we are really excited to be able to provide. Um, and I say all of this um, and not to lay crepe, uh, but as you're aware, there are some major challenges in terms of resources at the moment, um, and that is all having an impact on this. So just to flag that while 2024, this slide deck represents the intended realities from three and a half weeks ago, um, as of today, those timelines might look quite different. Um, and it's a, it's a very frustrating moment, uh, but one that we're doing everything we can to work around and through. Um, but I but I will flag that some of those timings are going to be subject to resource issues. So with that, um, let me open it up for questions. Um, why don't we start in the room while people come off mute or raise their hands? Yes, Karen. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Karen Raven from uh, Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Um, question, because I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I noticed that the hypoglycemia measure mentioned adult, so I'm assuming that's adult only, but that the other measures also include pediatric sites? And so for C. diff, hospital-acquired bacteremia? Karen, I, I think we'd have to look at the numbers. Um, I'm pretty confident that children's hospitals and then healthcare facilities with pediatric centers within them are all represented across NHSN. Okay. What I don't know is the extent of the early uptake, how much of that represents pediatrics, and how much of it is adults. Yeah, I was interested to see if there was any breakdown, um, you know, specifically for pediatric sites. And then I noticed, you know, you mentioned that the hypoglycemia measure would only be rolled out in adult acute care hospitals. Is that correct? Oh, so I have... I'm not really in, involved in the, I'm not the SME on this work, but my colleague, Ray Dantes, is on the line and said he, he's going to try and provide an answer in real time. So, um, Ray, I don't know if you can come off mute, but you can wait and see um, what his reply is to your question. I can't hear. Ray, if you're, if you're on uh, the call, Ray Dantes, can you raise your hand, please? Oh, he can't come off mute. Um, you can raise your hand. So once Ray joins us, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Karen's question. Um, Mike, I know you raised your, your flag. Thanks for the update for NHSN. It's really exciting to see just the, the growth of NHSN and just the movement towards objective and electronic measures. I think it's really a plus. Um, a, a question about the HTCDI. A metric. I'm wondering um, how the metric will deal with uh, places that are using CDI medications or prophylaxis, how that impacts the metric since it looks for new starts of CDI medications. In other words, will a unit that is using prophylaxis for all patients um, not have new CDI, HT CDI events because of the prophylaxis in place? So I think Ray will have an answer for that question as well. Oh, okay, great. Oh, this is Ray. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we yep, can hear you. Clear. All right. Um, so thank you for that uh, last question. I can I can answer. So we are definitely very um, you know, sensitive to this the growing use of uh, C. difficile prophylaxis and have been getting informal input from various folks to understand the variation in how treatment is, um, you know, this treatment is, is being done. Um, you know, we, uh, will be collecting information, very granular information, um, on the timing of, uh, C. difficile tests, uh, relative to the initiation of treatment and hopefully the variations in dosing as well. And so we're hoping that we'll be actually be able to tell the difference between prophylactic uh, treatment um, and uh, you know, therapeutic uh, treatment of, of C. difficile, um, when uh, creating this measure. Karen, are, are, are you good with where we are? Or did you want to reiterate a question? 
I don't know that it got answered. Um, but for the measures that were presented, C. diff, um, hospital card bacteremia, respiratory pathogen surveillance, that would include pediatric sites as well as adults. It looked like perhaps hypoglycemia was only rolling out in adult sites. Yeah, this is Ray. I'll get back to you about the um, eligible population for hypoglycemia, as I don't recall off the top of my head here. Um, but for, um, I think, for C. difficile, it would be, I think, uh, uh, I think there's a, a minimum age of one you know, to be included in the measure. And then for hospital onset bacteremia, it would include um, all age groups. Great. Thanks, Ray. Um, we have Hillary and then, uh, let me see, I think it was Sarah, Riza, and then Elaine. Um, thanks. I may have missed this. How does the, this hypoglycemia measure relate to the existing ECQM CMS Joint Commission hypoglycemia measure? They are ultimately intended to be unified. So there will not be two different measures. Um, and, <laughs> because and I can imagine that's the same. And the definitions are the same? Like so, so I don't want to overspeak on behalf of another agency. My understanding at the moment is that um, there's interest in replacing that with the updated electronic measure. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question, and this may be for Ray as well, is around the hospital onset bacteremia um, definition. I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but it, it looked like it sort of said any pathogenic bacteria, bacteria or fungi in a blood culture in a patient who's been in the hospital for more than four days. And I know that we continue to struggle um, even with the CLADC definition around some of the pathogens that are included on the list of things that make it a CLADC so that we have MAI bacteremia that I think still counts as a CLADC and some fungal bac fungemias um, that like endemic fungi that we see in the Midwest that if we find them in blood and they have a central line, they still count as a CLABSI, even though clearly not, you know, preventable by, by the hospital. Um, and so just worrying a little bit about how that plays into hospital onset bacteremia is an even broader population and even more likely to pick up um, some of those things. I assume that the goal is still to be focusing on things that are potentially preventable or that the measure will explicitly say clearly the goal is not zero. Like we're going to benchmark you against places, but it's not going to be zero if they're not, if they're things that people may have had and come in with already, not related to their medical care. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. You know, I would hope, you know, in most of those kinds of situations where you have, you know, these, these rare, um, you know, environmental pathogens, you know, that they would, um, you know, not show up, hopefully not show up on blood cultures, you know, collected after, you know, or after day four, um, you know, of the hospitalization. Um, but, um, you know, we do, this will be a risk adjusted measure. And we are, of course, you're very sensitive to that. This is a, a new uh, goal that we are reaching for um, as a field. Um, and uh, we have been you know, working with partners in the, um, in the epicenters, you know, to identify populations that are fairly reliably uh, not preventable. And we'll be planning to uh, exclude those, you know, from the the risk adjusted part of the measure. And so the population that seems to stand out the most right now are patients uh, with uh, pancytopenia undergoing chemotherapy. And of course, depending on your hospital, that could be a fairly sizable population. And so we see that those patients, you know, for example, have uh, when they do develop a uh, hospital onset bacteremia or fungemia, um, the subject matter experts you know, pretty reliably say that it wasn't a preventable event. And so we think we've developed some um, some ways to exclude that population from the measure. They will still count as a um, you know as an event, um, but then when it comes to creating you know that risk adjusted measure later on, they would be excluded from that uh, from that measure later on. And then the what's great about our um, our new platform for collecting digital information um, on patients is that you know as the field learns more and you know folks like yourselves or colleagues in the field you know are able to learn more about the preventability of various subtypes of of HOB you know, we can make you know adjustments you know to the measure to either exclude um, additional populations or if there have been advances in the field that say hey suddenly we we know how you know to uh, prevent you know these kinds of HOB events um, in this pancytopenic chemotherapy population, we can even go the other way and, and include them back into the measure. Thank you.
Thank you for that. I just um, want to be aware of the potential unintended consequences on anything that, that we put those times and days on when we know that there's risk that may exist otherwise, so that it kind of drives people to say, oh, everyone needs a blood culture in their first three days of hospitalization, just to be sure. Like all our HIV patients, all of our oncology patients probably just need a blood culture in those first three days to be sure that we don't miss an MAI that we then catch later when they have a fever on day five. So I just put that out there as something we just need to be thoughtful about as we decide which organisms are counted and how. So let's see, we have um, Sarah, Riza, and then Elaine. Sarah, do you want to start? And I think I think, I think Mofaki has also um, a, a hand up that we're not able to see. And then Lisa just added her hand. So Sarah first. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry my camera isn't working this morning, but I had a, a comment and then a, a question. And um, just, I'm just very excited for the automation component of um, this discussion and, and of policy where we're required to report all HEIs in Pennsylvania. It's much, much appreciated. But along those lines, I wanted um, just to put a plug in to be thoughtful about um, you know, partnerships with the vendors, uh, because although things are um, quote unquote automated, we've uh, studied our team's input and um, it can take 10 to 30 minutes per automated infection to troubleshoot issues with um, you know, that automatic upload. And so just want to be thoughtful about how can we get that a bit more streamlined um, and maybe partnership with some of these bigger events to be important with that. Um, the other, the question that I had was about the respiratory pathogen surveillance. And I had a question about whether that module will be um, for the evaluation of admissions and hospital onset infections. Will you be using the um, NHSN definitions for a respiratory infection or, or will you be providing clarification on what hospital onset means and will that be considering incubation periods? So I think um, we have Henrietta Smith is on the line, and if she can raise her hand and come off mute, I think that she can answer that question. I'm sorry, Henrietta, for calling you out, but um, I, from looking at the protocol now, this is for um, among patients admitted to the hospital. I don't know if that... Um, Help answer the question. Yeah, I think it'll be fine if Henrietta answers when she's able to, to, to join in. Um, so Sarah will come back to you. Uh, in the interim, Riza. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Good morning, everybody. I'm Risa Morrissey. I'm a liaison from the Society of Critical Care Medicine. So just like everyone, I'm so excited with the automation of our data. Um, what I wanted to say is just a comment. Um, if you guys have, um, it's in your radar that choosing wisely that everyone, a lot of institutions have now adopted. And this was started by the American Board of Internal Medicine about a decade ago, such that this data that you guys have, including the institutional data, would then be a nice, um, you know, collaboration such that we can all see and be transparent in how we are enhancing care and then only to provide quality of care to our patients, but as well as reducing costs, because that is the mission of um, Choosing Wisely campaign. Yep, Riza, thank you for that. Um, agree completely that um, making use of any data systems possible is a great idea. Um, a lot of what we're doing is taking the vendor neutral approach so that all IT vendors for EHRs can make use of our platforms and ultimately seamlessly deliver data. Um, and those IT platforms and EHRs are, are intended to also present uh, dashboards and, and related information back to the facilities. So there's that component that I think is already present. Um, the other thing that I'll share is that uh, an interesting factor with NHSN because of how it was developed. Those of you who have been around in infection control for a while 
know that this is a unit level utility that was designed to give information to people implementing infection control at the unit level. Um, so it's extremely granular. And that is very intentional from a utility perspective. It also has the side benefit that the minute you put your data in, you have complete access to it. Um, so there's no delay or um, analytical process. It goes in and you can see it. Um, and in fact, in many jurisdictions, the health system itself has a group function where it sees all of its facilities in real time when they enter data. Um, and some state authorities also use that group function so that they have a, a vision of how their state is doing. Um, so there are many ways to look at the data. Um, we're happy to talk further about it, actually, if, if um, there is a specific interest in SCCM. Uh, please let us know, and we'll set up a conversation. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and then, let's see, I think next we have Elaine and then Lisa McGifford. Good morning, yes. Um, I wanted to echo, this is Elaine uh, from uh, California, and I wanted to echo my appreciation for the automation, but my encouragement to work with the vendor systems very closely. Uh, we have implemented an electronic health record approximately four years ago that's commercial-based, and it does indeed seem that there's some different nuances, especially when it comes to bringing an NHSN criteria definition into their module. And so I just feel like there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the vendors to make sure they understand all those nuances. Only working with one, I don't know how difficult it is in the others. And then I would also ask the question with, again, emphasizing when they say automated transfer of data, I'm just learning myself now that a lot of the data sets that we're going to be sending automatically will require a manual verification of the data set that was pulled before it can be submitted. So I'm not quite sure how that process qualifies. <laughs> um, it's it's going to be challenging, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there. That I think the vendors uh, need to work very closely with NHSN versus us working with them afterwards, after we get the system in. Does that make sense? Yeah, Elaine, much appreciated. We actually provide a sort of... Um, artificial universe of NHSN for vendors to use and test their, um, uh, their, their utilities in before they go live. Um, and so that's a place where those things can be refined. I'll also say, though, that, you know, across the nation, every health system and sometimes every facility within a health system is a little different and has customized mm -hmm. things or wants to customize things. And it, it, it's never quite as straightforward as plug and play. Um, and so I will say that, you know, what you're describing is not unusual, um, but it's not so much about NHSN. It's really more about the health system ecology of, of data use. Um, I, I'm not okay. sure that we can fix that, but we can try to make it as easy as possible. The other thing that I'll say is that in terms of the um, uh, data set adjudication, there's a range of, quote, automation. Right, so there are automated forms that populate and, and, and get sent electronically. That was maybe a decade ago um, in terms of progress. Uh, there is sort of that intermediary um, sort of data set version. And then there's the, the direct fire communication where computers basically push or pull data automatically. Mm -hmm. um, the predecessor of that is the AUAR module that you just heard about where it's basically direct communication with the pharmacy information system and the lab information system. Um, and, you know, there too, as you probably know, there's complications with lab information systems because there's sometimes editing of results that happens automatically mm -hmm. at the diagnostic machine level. Uh, there, there are many layers of complication here. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're at anything close to done, uh, but the ve vector and trajectory is towards increased leveraging of, of those utilities. Um, that sounded jargony, sorry. But thank <laughs> no. you, we, we agree completely. No, thank uh, you very one much. One thing I'll flag, um, sort of in the vein of an Elaine Decker comment, is that as these things get automated, I do think that there's gonna be a need to remember to educate our users about what's going on under the hood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want it to turn into a black box exercise where there's just a, a, a result or a, a color code that comes out and no one's thinking about what went into it. Um, and so I see that as a future challenge based on our, on our quote, progress. Uh, thanks, Elaine. No, thank you, Mike. And just to say, I remember NIS, and I kind of miss NIS. 
<laughs> Lisa McGifford. Uh, good morning. Uh, I also remember NIS and as someone who was around at the beginning of uh, NHSN, it's really great to see how it's grown uh, and uh, more use of electronic measures, which we think are very important. Um, but we still want to see more public transparency regarding the data collected by NHSN. Too much of this important information is still kept secret. And I encourage CDC to be more proactive in making that happen. So the data could be used more widely to educate the public on when and where infections are happening and who they are affecting. Uh, there's so much information that you have in your possession that the public doesn't see. Uh, and also uh, it's uh, important for uh, the, the regular reports that CDC makes to the public interpreting uh, what, what you have collected is, um, is really valuable, but it just doesn't come out in a timely manner. And I know that's always been a challenge, but we would really like to see um, the reports be more timely uh, right now. Uh, they are, they're often a couple of years later and um, the information is not so useful to the public. Thank you. Lisa, thank you. Message received. Uh, we will try to get more data out faster. Um, the, the resource challenges at the moment are making that seem really daunting, but we will do our best. Um, Mo, thank you for waiting and being so patient. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, sorry I couldn't make it in person. Um, you know, I was very impressed with the update. Um, I have three comments. The first one came came up after, you know, the hub uh, fungemia uh, comment was, was made. I think a key element uh, for hub is to, instead of judging each hospital, their performance compared to others, I think it's good to risk adjust, but instead of judging that, focusing much more on trending per hospital, uh, you know, for that measure, because we're going to see something very similar to the hospital onset MRSA bacteremia issue that, and, you know, we may never perfectly risk, risk adjust. Um, I have two other comments, one about the hypoglycemia. We've been tracking it as a system for the last two years. It's a very good measure. Uh, you know, there, there was a PEATS ID talk. I think I heard that commented on the PEATS section. The neonates have an issue because they have a lot of hypoglycemia. So uh, so what we did as a system, we looked at with and without neonates. Uh, but this is a very great, you know, very important measure, especially with COVID and the use of steroids. And then post COVID and what happened, we've seen more hypoglycemia. It's very susceptible to workflow and, and how we give insulin to patients. So it's a great, great measure. The second one is the respiratory pathogen surveillance. I think it's very important. One caution here, especially for those of us who, who are doing a lot of work on diagnostic stewardship, is balancing the importance of surveillance and, you know, versus diagnostic stewardship. So what we have seen is a rash of increased use of respiratory pathogen panels, uh, you know, the, the, the multiplex PCRs without seasonality. And, and that, that would not help, uh, you know, care of patients. So, so I just uh, caution about, you know, pushing the surveillance without, without looking at diagnostic stewardship. For example, influenza testing should not be done the whole year. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paki, for those, for those comments. I think your, your diagnostic stewardship comments will make Dr. McDonald very happy as well. Uh, we agree <laughs> completely. And then we'll close out the session with uh, Erica Shinoy with one last thing. Actually, mine was uh, I have two, one question and a comment. And actually, the question is related to the last one, which is with the C diff um, assay, you you have to report what your testing strategy is. There's like eight different versions of testing strategies that you report on a on a basis at your facility, and I think that helps you interpret at the NHSN level. If we're going to do something, if you're going to do something similar with RPS. I think that's also, you got to think about seasonality and also the fact that facilities will be in a different place in terms of which of those viruses they'll be routinely testing for. So that might have implications. That was just a follow-up. And then the last part is more of like an observation. I don't know how you're thinking about this, but for the longest time, this has really been in the 
the infection prevention world, and it's clearly expanding to a lot of other parts. And at a, um, and I don't know what the answer to this is, but at a facility level, it makes me think that administrators or like the work that is done at the facility level is less and less just within infection control. And so there's a whole set of users that need to be educated and um, brought on board that are just not used to doing all this sort of work. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think what we mentioned about onboarding people who aren't ac accustomed to doing this work um, was a huge lift. You, meant, you know, did, Beth mentioned the help desk. It sounds like a small thing, like a, a table in the corner. It is a massive undertaking to, to do the technical support for people who are coming into it you know, out of the blue. So I think you're exactly right. There's definitely work to be done there. And then lastly, I want to see if Henrietta was able to join and be off mute. Um, do we want to reiterate the question? Yeah, um, if Sarah can repeat her. We have uh, Jennifer Watkins, who is our RPS SME, on the line to answer. Sarah, can you restate your RPS question real quick? Sure. Um, my question was whether we were going to be um, for the um, hospital onset um, part of that surveillance program, whether you were going to be using the definition for upper respiratory infections and um, whether you were going to be including incubation periods. Hi, Sarah. This is Jennifer. Right now, we are not um, at the point where we are um, applying a hospital onset definition to RPS. At this point, it's simply surveillance to see what's going on in the hospitals and what is being tested for and what results we're getting. At this point, there is no hospital onset determination being applied to that surveillance. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer, and thank you, everybody. We've gone a bit over, um, and apologies to our oral health colleagues, um, but I think we'll move forward now. Beth, thank you so much for that. Um,